appreciate you coming into the breakout. I see several familiar faces. There's a few people in the room here who have known me since I was about seven or eight years old, so they know well I don't know a damn thing. Uh, for, the, <coughs> for, the, for, the re for the rest of you, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name's Lance Tarchioni. I'm a technical agronomist with uh, Monsanto, supporting the DeKalb and Asgro brands in a territory that goes from roughly Bloomington to Carthage across west central Illinois. I've been with the company for a good many years, also uh, farm in Fulton, Knox, and Warren County when I can uh, sneak away from work. So uh, happy to be here this morning and, and please ask questions as we're, as we're going along. If I don't get through all my material, that's probably a good thing for you. And if I can answer your questions, I would much rather do that than, than just stand up here and talk at you. We're going to be talking about some technologies, some management practices, some strategies, maybe a few products that you can uh, integrate into your cropping system to hopefully improve your soybean yields if that is a goal that you have. I did get asked earlier this morning in a, <clears throat> in a radio interview, you know, should we be trying to increase yields or should we be trying to be profitable? Uh, he was more concerned about cost than he was yield. And I think typically, you know, in most economic studies that I have seen, you know, yield is the number one driver of profitability. And obviously we have to be prudent about how much money we spend as we look at our cropping budgets. But uh, if for every $10 you save, you lose a bushel and a half of yield, we're not really gaining anything there. What we're looking for is where can we spend $10 and maybe get $20 worth of yield? Or maybe we can spend nothing and get $20 worth of yield, which would be the, the best case scenario. So we'll just jump in here. <coughs> I'm going to start with a picture from one of my bean fields at home in 2014 that had me pretty excited. I, I really like the pod count that I'm seeing on these plants. These are 15 inch row no-till beans and, and I kind of accidentally got this picture. I had to drive through the corner of this field to clip a pasture in probably late July, early August. And uh, where I you know, made the path in with the tractor, I had an opportunity to take this picture. Fast forward to fall, um, I, I know this farm fairly well. That's my farmstead, my house and barn lot right, right there. Um, things didn't turn out quite as well as I had hoped. And if you're from West Central Illinois in 2014, there's another breakout session talking about SDS. Uh, had severe sudden death syndrome on this farm. So we actually ended up with uh, about 25% of the acres were less than 50 bushel. And some of that less than 50 was more like 30. It was well less than 50 bushel. Um, over 35% of the farm was over 70 bushel. And this small field here, which is actually where that picture came from, made 83. Now the, the fun and frustrating thing about soybeans and about sudden death is, um, this is the same variety planted on the same day on the same farm as this. So I was doing 80 plus here and about 40 over here. Different soils, different drainage, different disease pressure, um, but I had done you know, all the same high yield practices on this whole farm, uh, really didn't get to take advantage of them. Now I will say I'm glad I set out to raise 80 plus bushel beans because they made 63. If I would have set out to raise 63 bushel beans, I think they'd have made about 45. So, so hopefully I, I'm still doing the right thing there. But there are things that happen in the real world that you know, unfortunately impact the outcome. Talk a little bit about soybean yield potential. If you don't recognize it, this small shrub here hanging from the crane is a soybean plant in Brazil. Now some of you probably seen this picture before. This is not a new picture. It's been floating around for a while now. You know, here we have sometimes artificial yield contests to see how much we can get an acre of something to yield. In Brazil, they have an even more artificial yield contest to see how much yield they can produce from a single plant. So if you think about your soybeans, I'll go back to picture of mine here. You know, what do you figure, how many pods is on those plants? Kind of hard to see, you don't know how far up the plant goes, those were fairly tall beans. You know, what are you going to get for pod count on, on a good yielding soybean plant? Anybody got a number? 45. 45, you know, 50, 60, maybe if you're doing things right. Depends on population, right? <clears throat> so how many figures on that rascal there? <laughs> Anybody got a guess? 800. Okay, I hear 800. I'll, I'll give you a hint. Higher. 1,000. Higher. 5,000. Higher. 
It's like a land auction here. It's fun. <laughs> Would you believe 13,000 and change? Pods, not seeds, pods on that small soybean tree there. So <clears throat> if, you, if you had 500 of those in an acre, <laughs> that's 100 bushel beans. We did something similar at Monmouth a few years ago. They, they took some individual plants and they planted an individual seed about four feet apart. And for those of you that have been to the re, our research farm at Monmouth, that's some pretty, God, God bless Monmouth with some good soils. So that's some pretty good soil, high fertility, gave that plant all the sunlight, all the water, all the room, all the everything it wanted. Every time we walked past it, we talked nice to it, uh, gave it a little extra fertilizer, and at the end of the season, they harvested all the grain from those individual plants. And, and if, you know, you couldn't do this, but if you could have had 130,000 plants that had the same yield on it in an acre that those individual plants had, anybody have a guess what your yield per acre would have been from that experiment? Again, highly artificial. Couldn't be done, you know, you're not going to have a hundred and some thousand plants with that much yield on it. But if you could, what, what's a legal load on a semi? Notice I said legal. How many beans are you going to get on a semi legally? Maybe 900, 9, 910, 920, depending on what your truck weighs. That's what they would have yielded. So when we talk about what is the genetic potential or what is the yield potential of soybeans, it's kind of hard to figure because population enters into that, but it's obviously a hell of a lot more than the 63 that I raised two years ago on that farm. So let's look at some yield figures. Current U.S. record yield, verified anyway, is still at 160. I hear some people claiming that they have exceeded that, but, but that's still considered the record. We set a new record in Illinois uh, last year at 108.3. Same thing, there's been better beans than that raised in Illinois, but they weren't in a certified contest. Uh, we've equaled our state record the last two years of 56 bushel. When that happened in 2014, I was, I was pretty impressed. And in my part of the state, we weren't setting any record bean yields in 2014, but the state did as a whole. And then we followed that up with the identical, it's ironic, two years in a row, the state has averaged exactly 56 bushel is, is the estimate. Uh, several plots over 100 bushel in Illinois in both those years. So we've had back to back really good soybean years. So <clears throat> if you've raised the best beans you've ever had in your life on your farm one of the last two years, I I'm going to break it to you. That's not all because of your management. You know, we've had really good soybean years. And it's easier to make things look good when we have good, good environment, right? So we're going to talk today about some things that we can use to do or do to take advantage of a good environment and hopefully make the best of a bad environment. So what does drive soybean yield? So how many of you think one of the most worthless uses of your time would be to try to estimate what a bean field's going to yield before you get there with a the combine? I, I would agree. I don't do it anymore because it's the quickest way I know to make me look like an idiot is to try to estimate what your soybeans are going to yield. So <clears throat> the guy that raised 108 bushel beans here in Illinois last year, I'm proud to say that happened to be with one of our products. You know, he was estimating in August that, you know, he, we had a testimonial from him that he thought it looked like his beans were going to make 90 bushel. And I thought, oh, yeah, right. You know, we all think they're going to make 90 bushel in August. Well, he was 18 bushel low. So um, good, good for him. So the, <clears throat> the yield of a soybean plant is fairly simple. It's number of seeds, number of pods, and what's the seed weigh? And, and really, you can break that yield down into those components. And it, and it really only matters the seed weight per acre. So you can have a whole bunch of little seeds. You can have a few big ones. You can get to that yield figure any way you want. <clears throat> so we've all heard that uh, 50 to 60% of soybean flowers abort, right? Have you heard that? You know, what would a soybean plant look like if we could hang on to a few more of those flowers? Anybody ever seen a plant potted like those? You know, not very often, but you know, that's, that's a pretty impressive pod set. So that's what we're trying to do is keep more of those blooms, turn those blooms into pods, hopefully three and four bean pods, not one and two bean pods. So let's look at, uh, at some data here. 
not real pretty graphs to look at, I know. But <clears throat> this is as close. Any statisticians in the room? Math or stats majors? Okay, good. You won't know if I know what I'm talking about or not. So R squared, I'll tell you real quick what R squared means. R squared is just a statistical estimate or model of how well this line fits the data. So if every data point was on that line, you'd have an R squared of one. That's as, that's as good a correlation as you can get. If you have an R squared of close to zero, if, if, there's, if these blue dots were scattered randomly all over this graph and we just plopped a line on there and there was no correlation between the data and the line, you'd have an R squared of zero. So the closer this R squared number gets to one, the better the statistical correlation of that line is to the data. And all this graph is saying is that the seed number per plant is highly correlated to the yield per plant. Didn't need to spend a lot of money to figure that out probably, right? Does that make sense? The more seed you've got on a plant, probably the more it's gonna yield. The second highest correlated uh, yield trait is pod number. So a lot of times when they're doing yield estimates on soybeans, they do pod counts. So there's a fairly good correlation between pod count and yield as well, although not as high as, as seed count. So how about seed number per pod? You remember a few years ago when, when Roundup 2s came out, we were doing the five bean pod thing and people had fun with that and some people poked fun at that. And you know, it's kind of fun to find a five bean pod. I've, I've found a couple. It doesn't correlate very well to yield. So, so Roundup Ready to Yield soybeans didn't yield more because they had an occasional five bean pod on them. That's not where the yield's coming from. If, if you find a five bean pod, you know, it might be the only pod at that node. And I'd a lot rather have four three bean pods on that node than one five bean pod. So the correlation between pod seed number per pod and, and yield's not that good. The worst correlation is actually seed size. So how many of you have heard somebody say, if you want big yield, you gotta plant big seed, or big seeded beans yield more? You've heard all that, I, not much to that. Um, seed size is influenced by lots and lots of things, and if you think back to 2012, what happened in 2012? Drought. Drought. So did we have good pod counts in 2012? Generally, no, not very many pods on a plant. What happened late season in 2012, early September? Started getting some rain from a hurricane, right? So you got a plant that's got a handful of pods on it, and late in the season, life got pretty good. And so what it do? The only thing it could do, made some huge honking seed. And we struggled with, you know, big seed spring of 2013 that drove guys crazy trying to plant the things because the seed size was so big. The yield was terrible, but the seeds were huge. So, so not a great correlation between seed size and yield. <clears throat> so really, if we're trying to raise higher yielding soybeans, here's just some oversimplified, you know, things that you might want to keep in mind. So choosing the right variety, we'll talk about that a little bit. This is not going to be an as-grow commercial, so don't worry about that. Uh, plan a range of maturities. Why do we plan a range of maturities? Spread your risk. Spread your risk. But you want to skew towards the fuller season side of things. You know, you can raise, you know, in central Illinois, I'm going to say full season is anything mid three or later. We can have some really high yielding late group twos, but on average, group twos are not going to keep up with group threes in central Illinois. And we'll look at a little bit of data on that. Planting date's huge. Uh, people get tired of me talking about planting date, but plan at the optimum time for your geography. We'll talk about what optimum means, and optimum does not mean whenever you get done planting your corn in most cases. Use a rose, this is another one that irritates people. You know, how many of you guys that like 30 inch row soybeans would be excited to, you know, retool to plant something different than 30 inch row soybeans? Most people don't care what any agronomist thinks about row spacing because you do it the way you like to do it and that's why you're doing it the way you do it. I would say, how many of you have heard that you can't get agronomists to agree on anything? If you've got five agronomists, we're not going to agree on anything. The one thing that you might get five agronomists to agree on is that a row spacing less than 30 inches is better. There's a lot of data that says that from seed companies, from universities, from consultants. You know, about any research trial you pick up, you're going to see something narrower than 30 inch rows yield better. But yet, guys that plant 30 intro soybeans, they have their reason for doing it. I'm not going to try to change your mind. I'm just going to show you some data. We'll talk a little bit about fertility and pH. 
balanced and early canopy development. Do not overseed. So soybeans are just the opposite of corn. The better your soil, the earlier you plant, the more high management practices you're doing, the more you're driving for higher yield, probably the fewer seeds you want to drop. So we're not going to be promoting really high seeding rates to get really high soybean yields. I, I, I contend that most producers in the state of Illinois are probably still overplanting their soybeans. How many seed growers in here? Anybody produce seed for a seed company? You know, guys that raise seed typically are fairly comfortable getting their seeding rates down because if you grow for ASGRO, we're probably only going to give you about 115 or 117,000 per acre to plant the field. So, so when I'm with a group of seed growers and I make a seeding rate recommendation of 120,000, they don't really freak out. You know, in a, in a normal meeting, I'll get some guys freaking out when I say 120,000. And, and I, I've been at this a while. Um, I learned many years ago, I work for a seed company. One of the dumber things for me to do would be to get in an argument with a farmer and make him mad because he wants to plant more of my product than I say he needs to. So pick, pick your battles. Is that due to lodging? Typically, yes. Yep. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And then down here, minimize stress. You know, it's all about getting as many blooms as you can get, turning as many blooms as you can into a pod, and then getting as many seeds as you can in that pod, and then once they're there, making that seed as big as you can make it. And the way you're going to do that is by minimizing the stress on that plant. Now, sometimes we can do that, sometimes we can't. Mother Nature is largely in control of this. But, but we can certainly have some influence. So here would be a long list of practices that, that I put, put together. Most of these don't have a lot of cost associated with them. These are more things that you can do rather than things that you need to buy. Now you'll, you'll pick on me here. Obviously if you don't have anything but a 30 inch row planter, there's a pretty significant cost to getting a different planter. If you're going to try to plant corn and beans at the same time, which is something I recommend if you're trying to maximize your soybean yields, obviously you've got to have the manpower and you've got to have the equipment to do that, and there's a cost associated with that. So that's certainly not free. Uh, timely harvest is, you know, that's a fairly low cost practice. I mean, we know when we're harvesting 8% soybeans that we're losing yield, right? You know, how many different ways are you losing yield there? You're losing it just in the water that you could have been selling that you're giving away. More shatter loss, more harvest loss. You know, it's fairly easy to calculate a five or six bushel yield hit if we're cutting 8% soybeans. So timely harvest is big. Timely planting is, is huge. You know, it doesn't necessarily cost us any more to plant a couple weeks earlier, you know, assuming we're equipped to do it and we've got the right weather conditions. Timely weed control is a big thing for me. Um, we may not have time to get into this data here, but I, I've been around long enough. I remember when Rounder Pretty Soybeans came out in 1996 on the home farm. We were spraying, you know, Prowl Pursuit based program at that time for soybean weed control and for, for my retailers in the room. How many days after planting were you supposed to spray Pursuit? Anybody remember? 18 to 21 days. Wasn't a lot of scouting involved, it was just, you know, okay, I planted beans then, 18, 20 days later, I'm back in the field spraying. Why were we doing that? Why so early? Needed to get small weeds. So we, we had a product at that time that would only kill small weeds and it had residual. So we sprayed early. We switched to a product that would kill larger weeds and had no residual, so it makes sense that we would shift that later. The first year we sold around a pretty soybeans, our recommendation <clears throat> was to let the weeds get that tall, six inches. So we'd use a pop can as, a, as an experiment. And you, that first year, you'd have thought I was asking guys to you know, give me their firstborn son. I can't let them get that big, that's crazy. You gotta get weeds when they're small. Within a couple years, we got really comfortable with this, and then we got comfortable with that, and then we got comfortable with this, and then we got, and you know, pretty soon, you know, we're spraying a lot of knee-high weeds. How many of you have heard that soybeans are tolerant of early season weed competition? That's true. They are far more tolerant than corn. Tolerant does not mean immune. So, you know, when we've got 12 inch tall foxtail growing with our soybeans, we're losing yield. That's another thing we can do that doesn't cost a ton of money. 
So there's just a lot of other practices up here. Crop rotation is a big one. Most guys that win yield contests with soybeans are following multiple years of corn. I'm a lot more impressed with 80 bushel beans and a 50-50 rotation than I am 100 bushel beans following 10 years of corn. It doesn't take a great soybean agronomist to raise really good soybeans if you're following 10 years of corn. So there, there is an advantage there. So if you just want to raise better beans, unfortunately, one of the best ways to do that is to plant them less often. <clears throat> now, if you can't manage that corn on corn, that might not be the most profitable rotation. It just makes the highest yielding soybeans. So there's challenges there. So let's look at a little bit of data. This is some row spacing data. This is coming from Monmouth. And it is a true statement that the better your soil, the smaller the disadvantage for 30 inch rows. So we're looking at data from some of the best soil God ever made here at the research, our research facility in Monmouth. And if you look across there, there's some damn good yields with 30 inch row soybeans, 75, 74. But you'll also notice that it's never been the highest yielding system that we've, that we've tested. They've had really good luck with twins. I'm not gonna be promoting twin row soybeans here today, but just a, an artifact looking at that data. They've had very good luck with, with twin, twin row soybeans at Monmouth. Uh, our, our manager there, he, he believes his reason for that is you've got pretty good air movement through the canopy like you would in wider rows, but because you got the twin, you're getting quicker canopy closure, and so, so he, he thinks there's something to that. I, what's that? In 2011 with uh, the 20 inch row? Yeah, couldn't, couldn't tell you. You know, whether that's just a fluke in the data. Um, we haven't had great luck. You know, most of the soybeans in the state that aren't in 30s are in 15s. 15s haven't done as good in this data as 20s and twins. So the, the point here is not necessarily to promote any particular system, it's just to show some data, um, you know, multi year data. You know, you're probably giving up some yield if you're planting in 30 inch rows. Now we'll talk about planting date here in a minute. And if you want to make the argument that well, I get my beans in 10 days quicker because I'm using my big 30 inch row planter, I'm going to gain more in planting date than I'm going to lose in row spacing. There's some truth to that. So, you know, there's, there's real world stuff here that you have to consider and, you know, if you're farming 400 acres of soybeans like I am, you know, if I'm going to gain two bushel the acre on 400 acres, it's going to take me a long time to pay for a new planter. I get that too. So this is some data from 2015. This is five locations. This, these averaged, uh, this is a mixture of 15s and 20s. Three bushel difference there. You know, again, you know, if your beans made 72, how upset are you going to be with that? You know, if you didn't know they could have made 75, what's wrong with 72? So there's some awfully good beans in 30 inch rows. Talk about planting date a little bit. Uh, planting date's a big one for me. Um, I, I think we're giving up, I'm gonna say close to five bushel on our state average yield of soybeans just because of planting date. And if we could all move our planting date up a couple weeks versus wherever it is now, um, I, I think we would see higher yields across the state. This is a four location study. Uh, this came kind of out of Southern Illinois. You'll see the early dates, not that early. You know, you'd, you'd like to plant early in Southern Illinois, but a lot of times you can't. So this is comparing a mid-May to a mid-June. The range of dates is because there's four locations and they didn't all get planted at the same time. You can see pretty consistent across these seven different varieties. Uh, the yield difference. This is a little bit of data out of Central Illinois. This is seven locations from 2015. Um, the 14 data was a little prettier graph. The 14 data, the really early and the kind of early were the same and then later dropped off. You notice this is, this is only mid-May. So that's not late, that's what we used to call optimal, right? So there really is no late planting date up here. And in our data from this past year, the, the, the best time to plant soybeans was the last couple days of April, first few days of May. Um, that's fairly consistent. Uh, I don't mind planting soybeans in April if we've got a good weather forecast and good soil conditions. Uh, I'm not going to tell you to plant your beans before you plant your corn. I'm not going to tell you to quit planting corn to go plant beans. Um, you know, I'm not going to tell you that corn suffers less from late planting than soybeans. I don't believe any of that. But soybeans like to be planted early too. And we've also got some data, I think it's the next one coming up here. 
<coughs> this, is, this is not yield, this is yield response to management. We also see this fairly consistently. Not only do you get a yield increase from planting earlier, the things that you invest money in try to, try to get more yield, like R3 fungicide and seed treatments and additional fertility and some of those other practices we're going to talk about, you tend to get a bigger bang for your buck out of those practices if you plant earlier. So this is looking at the magnitude of the response to intensive management system. Now you might say, well, that's only five bushel. I'm not sure that's profitable to do a lot to get five bushel. But we did the same thing here that we did over here, and we got half as much yield increase on the later planting date. So if you do want to do some things to try to drive your yields higher, you're probably going to see a better bang for your buck or, or more of a response if you're planting earlier. Those 108 bushel soybeans I mentioned that were grown in Champaign County this year, I think those were planted April 23rd. So, you know, real world scenario, um, you know, I, I'm not going to give you a date because, because there is no particular date. Uh, we need to have good soil conditions. It'd be nice to have soil temperatures of 55 or better and a five to seven day weather forecast that's not too scary. And, you know, stand establishment and rainfall patterns can and will offset early planting uh, in some growing season. So what that means is you can't just slop them in in the, in the worst conditions ever and expect them to yield more because you planted early. So, so we need to have, you know, the good conditions to go along with the early planting to, to see an advantage out of that. And I will mention, back up a slide here, <coughs> notice this April 16th date. We had two locations um, planted on April 6th, two plots planted April 16th at Auburn, which is a little bit south of Springfield at a research site we've got. And, and those beans really struggled. They got pounded in with the rain right after planting. We had some herbicide injury and, and those plots didn't yield very well. They were about 10 bushel less than the first of May planting at that location. And that one location is what drove, drove this early planting down. The other locations that are in that early planting window, um, they yielded as well or better than the, than the second planting date, but we did have one location where you know, we did have a, a negative response to early planting, and that was that really early April 16th planting date. Okay, so touch a little bit on weed control. I talked about this already, so I won't belabor the point. Uh, this is some old university data going back over 10 years, so untreated, so no, no weed control, hand weeded check, uh, a good pre followed by post, you know, uh, season long weed control program. And then here are all the different timings when that post application was made. So we let the weeds get up to zero to four, four to eight, eight to 12, you know, you see get pretty extreme here. And if you're controlling weeds when they're, you know, two foot tall or more, it's not going to yield. It probably looks a lot better than this at the end of the season from the combine seat, but it's not going to yield a whole lot better than that. So the damage is already done at that point. Here's some data from Monmouth, uh, similar type study, um, <clears throat> looking at different timings of weed removal. You can see up to four inches. Uh, we had a 70 bushel yield. And once again, you know, out here, it's letting them get up to 16 inches tall. If that field's clean as a pin at harvest time, and they make 58, you know, how upset are you going to be at that? You don't know that they could have made 70. And 58 doesn't sound too bad until you compare it to 70. And, and all these plots were clean at the end of the season. Okay, let's talk a little bit about variety selection. The, the first thing anybody's going to tell you about, you know, trying to win a yield contest or trying to raise your yields is, well, you got to be careful what you plant. You got to plant the highest yielding stuff, right? How many of you have heard that? You've all heard that. So <clears throat> what's, what's the trick? It's easy to tell you what the highest yielding stuff was after you harvest. Predicting what's going to be the highest yielding stuff is the tricky part. You know, you can see the difference between the years. So here's averaging in the 70s and 14, averaging in the 50s and 12. You know, that's the environment. Here's the range from the poorest performing variety to the best performing variety. And notice that's fairly consistent, honestly. In the high yield year, the range gets a little wider. And notice the range is pretty similar if you look at group fours versus group threes. 
Uh, remember, we're, we're kind of a little bit south here, so a group four would be full season variety, a three would be kind of early. So you can kind of think of this as a, and I could have easily done this with group twos and group threes from another region. But, you know, there's a, you know, there's a pretty big difference between the lowest yielding product and the highest yielding product in any trial in any given year. And, and the best we can do to, to try to pick products from the higher yielding end of things uh, hopefully will put us in a better position. You'll also notice, I mentioned before, skew towards the full season. You know, notice the average advantage, about a two bushel advantage for the full season varieties here, uh, about two and a half bushel advantage for full season here. So not that you can't get a good yield with earlier products, but you know, you're generally not going to out yield a full season product with an early product. Just to illustrate that further, this is some data from Dr. Bilo from, uh, from 2015. So here would be the yield in this column of 17 different varieties. So one, two, three, four, five, six, 12, five more, 17. So here'd be the maturity group, here'd be the yield. So that's a variety, that's a variety, that's a variety. And if you look through there, you know, when you start getting up into the mid and late threes, you know, here's where all the big yields are. Um, you know, here's a, here's a group two that was over 60. You know, and, I, and I've seen group two beans make 80 bushel in northern Illinois. They're generally not going to make 80 bushel in central Illinois. So just, just some further evidence that, you know, we don't want to plant, you know, I've got some guys that, you know, one of our biggest selling beans happens to be a 3.8. And, you know, I got a lot of guys that don't want to vary much off of a 3.8. They're planting 40% of their acres in that particular product, and then they'll put a 3.6 with it and a 3.9 with it, and everything they plant's from a 3.6 to a 3.9. And they've heard me say, you know, stay towards the fuller season side of things. Well, what's the challenge in that? You know, if you get them all planted timely, they're all going to be ready to cut about the same time. Then you can't be timely on your harvest. And remember, we talked about that. Uh, you've also got more weather risk. So, I mean, there, there's real world stuff that happens here. And, and if you cut a group two at 14%, it will probably out yield a 3.8 at 8%. So if spreading out your maturities helps you be more timely with your harvest, you might gain more in harvest ability than you lose in genetic potential. So we talked a little bit about multi-year corn. Um, multi-year corn is kind of magic for beans, guys. Um, they, just, they just love following multiple years of corn. So, so any of you in here that are doing some corn on corn, if you're trying to win a soybean yield contest or you want to impress your neighbors, you want to impress your landlord or impress your wife or your girlfriend or whoever you're trying to impress, um, do it in that field that's been four, five, six years of corn. Um, that's where you're going to get your big bean yields. Um, you know, microbials are a huge thing these days for, for Monsanto and for other people in ag. And, you know, if we could someday put it in a bottle and sell it to you to spray it on the field, you know, whatever the magic soil chemistry, soil biology aspect of multiple year corn is for soybeans, uh, that would be a nice product to have. But uh, soybeans just love following multiple years of corn. Now, if you, you know, the tricky part of that is what? You gotta get through the third, fourth, fifth year corn to get to those really good soybeans. And, and we've all had bad experiences there. So there's, there's trade-offs and everything, but if you're, if you're trying to win a soybean yield contest, I'd be raising some fourth and fifth year corn to set my field up for that. That's gonna be my soybean yield contest field. Yes, sir? That's better, but it's not as good as four or five years of corn. So, so my recommendation is, um, and, and when we were heavy corn on corn a few years ago, there were a lot of guys that were doing this. They would take certain farms that they'd had really good corn on and that they'd had frustrating soybean yields on, and they'd say, well, this is a corn farm. It just likes corn better. It's better for corn. I'm just not going to raise beans here. And then on their lighter, tougher ground where they were more scared of corn on corn, they'd stay with a 50-50 rotation. And so you can end up being 75% corn with some farms that are all corn and some farms that are 50-50, right? You can get to that 75-25. My argument is a better way to be 75-25 is to plant soybeans one year out of four on every acre. So to go to a three to one or a two to one or a four to one or, you know, if, if you want to be two thirds corn, great. Do a two to one rotation. If you want to be three-fourths corn, great. Do a three-to-one rotation. 
If you want to be 80% corn, do a five to one rotation, four to one, whatever the math works out to be. So we talked about seeding rate a little bit. So <clears throat> here's, here's a piece of worthless information that you can store away. Uh, based on all the data that we've done looking at seeding rate in soybeans, you might want to write this down. The optimal seeding rate for soybeans, year in and year out, based on our research, will be somewhere between 80,000 and 200,000 seeds per acre. <laughs> so, not much you can do with that, right? So let's look at, you know, let's look at a particular trial that we did. This was, uh, this was a replicated study. These seeding rates range from 100 to 175. And this is looking at planting data as well. So let's look at this early window, which is where I talked about wanting to be. Um, you know, that's about as even as you're going to get field data to come out. It just didn't matter. So, you know, year in and year out, the optimum probably is going to be more often somewhere in that 120 to 160 range. We're putting 140 in a bag for two reasons. You know, reason number one would be 140 fits in a bag pretty well. The other reason would be that's good math. You know, one bag to the acre to 140,000. Um, I'm no-tilling 15-inch row soybeans on not the best ground in the world in Fulton County, and, and I drop 140. There really is no reason to increase your seeding rate beyond 140,000 unless you know the day you're there, you know, only half of them are going to come up. And, and we really don't know that. If, if, if you know that, then you ought to quit planting if, if conditions are that bad. Yes, sir? Um, what rows, is there a certain row space here? I, I'm guessing these were all 30s. I can't answer that question. What do you do if you're drilling? Uh, first? Okay, good, good question. So in a, in a perfect world, if we knew where every seed was going, 140 would be enough in a drill, too. In a real world, I can remember, I, I grew up on a no-till farm. My, my dad and I, we ran a tie no-till drill for a lot of years. And, and you know how my dad checked his seeding depth on our tie drill? If he couldn't see seed laying on top of the ground from the operator's seat of the tractor, he knew he was planting too deep. Because that seed was going to be somewhere between, it was in a three-inch range. So if you had some seed on top, you had some at three inches. And, and that's the way he knew that most of it was probably about an inch and a half. So, so if, if your depth control is not good, if your seed to soil contact is not good, you've got that drill slop factor going on, I still make a lot of drilled recommendations of 160, 170, 180,000 because I know there's probably 30 or 40,000 of them that aren't where you want them to be. So the slower you go, the better job you do, the, the better row unit you have on your drill, you, you can back those seeding rates down too. Uh, Emerson Apsiger is another one of the presenters. I don't know if Emerson will show this data, but they did some, some pretty good work several years ago. And, and they looked at the response to population across row spacings. And it didn't make any difference. Whatever was the optimum population in 30s, the same population was optimum in a drilled scenario. So there's really no agronomic reason, in my opinion, to increase your seeding rate because you're in narrow rows, but most people still do. Some of the drive back to 30-inch row soybeans in northern Illinois was caused by white mold a few years ago, hoping to get better white mold control. The other thing that drove guys to 30s was our seed got too expensive, right? And you wanted to save money on seed. So I'm going to plant 30-inch rows. I can, I can reduce my seeding rate. You could have reduced your seeding rate with your old narrow row planter and probably been in a better spot. So the reducing the seeding rate part was the right decision, but you didn't need to go back to 30s to do that. Okay, so I don't know how much time, how we're doing on time. This is kind of the other side of things. This is what everybody always expects to hear when you talk about high yield soybeans is, what, okay, what are all the things I'm supposed to be spending money on to make my soybeans yield more? So this is kind of the list of, of products and things that, uh, that you might spend money on to increase your yield. pH is at the top of my list. If, if you don't have your soil pH right, and I'm gonna define right as 6.4 to 6.7, the first thing I'd spend money on is lime. If, if you come to me and say, I got a soil that's really low in P and K and the pH is 5.9, how much P and K do I need? I'm going to tell you none until you get your pH up. So, so I'm going to spend my money on pH first 
it affects a lot of things in the soil. Here would, here would be the reason why we're, we're looking at this, something in the mid sixes here. So pH affects the availability of virtually everything in the soil. It affects the soil chemistry, it affects the soil biology, it affects the rhizobium in the soil, it affects the availability of all these nutrients, and, and it's really the easiest soil um, thing to manage. Um, you know, I know lime costs more than it used to, trucking's higher than it used to be. You know, I, I, I live pretty close to a quarry, and by the time I get it spread, I'm, I'm about $20 a ton on lime. So, you know, if you need three ton of lime, that's 60 bucks. I mean, that's, I don't have 60 bucks in my budget to spend, but somehow over time, we, we need to be working towards that. So, so don't be short in your pH. If we just look at nutrient uptake, um, does it surprise anybody that takes 360 pounds of nitrogen approximately to raise 70 bushel beans? Anybody putting 360 pounds in on their 70 bushel beans? So where's all that coming from? Lightning, rainfall. So most of that's fixed nitrogen. They're gonna fix their own. Soybeans are legume, as you know, the rhizobium bacteria, they're gonna fix a lot of their own nitrogen. So probably about 60% of that will be fixed, and about 40% of that they're gonna take from the soil. So, so soybeans actually, I'll, I'll let you in on another little secret. Um, how many of you have heard about the soybean nitrogen credit? That, that 40 pounds, mysterious 40 pounds that you get to reduce your nitrogen rate for corn following soybeans. Um, calling that a credit was really a mistake in my, in my opinion. We should really talk about a 50 pound corn on corn penalty, not a 40 pound soybean credit, because soybeans are not leaving nitrogen in the soil for your corn to use. They make nitrogen, but they take up more than they make. So there will be less nitrogen in your soil after you grow a soybean crop than there was before you grew them. So it's, they're not leaving nitrogen there for your corn crop. There's, there is a difference in the optimal end rate for, for ro based on rotation, but it's not because they're leaving nitrogen behind. They use a tremendous amount of potassium. So potassium is, is a big, uh, big nutrient for soybeans and use quite a bit of phosphorus. So, Another pet peeve of mine, and I think it was on my first list of things you can do that don't cost a ton of money, I would spread every acre every year for P and K. Um, we need to quit fertilizing our corn and expecting soybeans to live on the scraps if, if you want to make your soybeans the best they can be. So, so I do, at home, I do removal rate spreading based on my yield maps behind every crop every year. So I'm going to be putting on a slug of phosphorus ahead of soybeans because I'm putting on phosphorus based on the re removal of the previous year's corn crop. So if you were blessed with some 250 bushel corn last year, you're going to put a lot of phosphorus on ahead of your soybeans. And that, and that seems kind of backwards. I, I had a conversation with a guy about trying to find triple super so I could put a lot of phosphorus on without putting a lot of nitrogen on, which that can be hard to, hard to find triple super these days. The other thing that's going on is not only are we putting our fertility on ahead of our corn, because corn, corn's what we love most, right? You know, um, that's, that's our favorite crop for most of us, even though we're at a soybean meeting here, we'll, we'll be honest about that. And so, you know, if you're gonna shortchange something, it's sure as hell not gonna be my corn crop. Um, so I'm gonna put fertility on ahead of my corn, and I'm gonna take advantage of that nitrogen that's in my dap. So that, that's one thing that's hurting me, doing what I'm doing. You know, all that dap I'm gonna put on ahead of soybeans, you know, that nitrogen that my corn crop could have used, you know, is it going to benefit my soybeans? Maybe. We'll, we'll look at some data on that, too, if we have time. But it would have been easier to take credit for that ahead of my corn. And so, if you think of it, you know, after soybeans, I'm going to put on fertility for what they removed ahead of corn. Well, soybeans don't remove as much phosphorus, so I'm not putting on a lot of DAP ahead of corn. So I don't get that cheap nitrogen ahead of my corn crop. So that's a, that, that's a, that's a penalty the other way. But if you look at the removal rate for 250 bushel corn and 70 bushel beans, anybody ever done the math on that? 365 pounds of DAP. How many of you used to be on a 200-200 or a 250-250 program? You know, any of you ever on a 365 DAP program? You know, probably not, unless you were trying to do some buildup. This is no buildup. This is just maintenance. So this is assuming your soil test is where you want it to be. Because putting on 365 pounds of DAP for this two-year rotation is not going to increase your soil test. So if you're making these kind of yields, 
Um, I know the, the guy that spoke here last year that raised 100 bushel soybeans and won the yield contest last year, you know, he, he wanted to raise 100 bushel soybeans. So he told his fertilizer dealer, and I imagine he was excited when he got this call, I want to put on fertilizer for 100 bushel beans. So I'm going to share some data from Dr. Belo here. Um, <clears throat> this is some really neat stuff. You've probably seen Dr. Belo give his presentation. I am not near as entertaining as Fred is. I'll, I'll warn you about that up front. So this is his uh, standard versus high yield system. So he likes the orange and blue. So the orange is the standard in each of these. So he's looking at these six factors. The blue is the high management system. And we'll, we'll dig into a little bit of data here. So just comparing the standard program to the high input program at these three locations. Now he's been doing this for three years and this is the biggest response he's ever had. So he had some, some really, really impressive uh, yield responses to his high management program this past year. So that's a really busy slide. This is his omissions trial that he does. And this is, this is something pretty unique. I don't know anybody else that has, has done anything like this. And, and I think this is a great way to look at it. And the best analogy I can think of, any bas basketball fans in the room? Let's say you got a pro basketball team and you got a high school basketball team. You got five guys on each team. One by one, you take a pro player and you substitute him in for a high school player on the high school team. So then you got four high school players and a pro guy on that team. And how does that impact that team? Versus the other way, let's say you got five pro players and one by one you take a pro guy out and you substitute in a high school player. How does that impact that team? So what Dr. Belo's doing here is he's got his high tech system, which is everything, and then one by one, he removes one of these practices and leaves all the others in there. And then he does it just the opposite way too. You've got your traditional program, and this is, this is more what we do down here, right? You got your way of doing things, and you try one new thing. So you don't change anything else, you just do one new thing. And how does that impact it? So let's look at it the way we do it. So here's your standard program, yielded 70 bushel. And each one of these things he added to that standard program, and here was the yield increase that he got from the one thing. Remember when he did them all, it was like 16 bushel more. But if you just pick one, and this is where Dr. Belo's work is, is kind of controversial for some people, and it's raised some eyebrows, got some people scratching their head. What do soybeans use more of, potassium or phosphorus? Potassium. Potassium, right? By a huge amount. How much of a yield impact is he getting from potassium additions? Now I will say in this soil he's working in, very high soil test level. Soil test would say he doesn't need either nutrient. But Dr. Belo's work has shown he's getting some very nice responses out of phosphorus on soybeans. You know, we typically think of phosphorus being more of a corn nutrient than a soybean nutrient. Uh, his, his work has shown that soybeans like phosphorus too. So how about if you do it the other way around? Let's say you got your Cadillac program here. And, and, and who, who's, whose budget looks good with a Cadillac program this year? My, mine does not, I'll, I'll share that with you. Even if you've got reasonably priced land, a Cadillac program doesn't really look good on a budget this year. So, so if I'm gonna cut something, what, what can I cut and not hurt my yield? You know, Dr. Belo is not selling any potassium for anybody because his, his potassium data um, is just shocking to me. Uh, I, you know, I think soybeans like potassium. I, I think we've got some soils that would yield better if they had better potassium levels, but he's getting, if anything, a yield decrease from additional potassium in, in, in his trials. So, so he's not hurting himself any by, by pulling that potassium application out. Um, got a nice response to phosphorus. Look at his row spacing down here. If he did nothing but, he, he kept all these. The only thing he changed here was he went from 20s to 30s and lost seven and a half bushel. Now if you remember, when you did it the other way around, to your standard program, if the only thing he did was go from 30s to 20s, he only added 3.6. So the penalty for wide rows is probably bigger at higher yield levels where you're doing more things to try to make your beans yield more. 
if you're raising 45 bushel beans, you're going to have mediocre beans whichever way you plant them. Not going to make that big a difference. So in one of the other breakouts, I would guess you'll see some Olivo data. Another breakout is looking at uh, soybean uh, sudden death control. And, and Olivo was something we were really excited about a year ago. Some of us are still excited about the potential for Olivo. Uh, we didn't see a huge Olivo response last year in our data because we had very, very low disease pressure. You know, that, that yield map I showed you at the start of the presentation, I sure as heck wish I'd have had some Olivo on those beans in 2014. Um, I wish I could predict when sudden death is going to be that bad. You know, it's kind of like crop insurance. If you knew which years you needed it, it'd be a lot more profitable, right? Um, you know, some of these practices are the same way. We did see a bigger response from the earlier planting dates, um, had no response from the later planting dates. Uh, I'll be anxious to see what Angie has to say about planting dates and sudden death. Uh, historically, that's been a kind of a taboo thing to plant early because we're worried about sudden death. Um, hopefully, as, as genetics continue to improve and we have more tools to manage some of these problems, um, ho hopefully that's not as big a concern, but it was interesting to us. We did get our biggest advantage from the seed treatment on the earliest planted locations. Uh, let's see, uh, a little bit of fungicide data here. Uh, this is your typical R3 uh, fungicide and insecticide application, so fairly standard high management practice. Five minutes, okay, thank you, sir. Um, and you know, this is not a, not a huge response here. We had a bigger response in 14, average 5.2, was only 3.3 in 15. Uh, we were at some pretty good yield levels here in, in both years, there would be the two year average. Um, you know, Dr. Belo's work showed about the same, you know, response if you looked at with and without fungicide and insecticide at R3. So I'll touch on this, this is kind of interesting. This is, um, you know, when, when soybeans are really rocking and rolling and nutrient uptake is at its peak, which, which rapid uptake starts at the sixth to ninth trifoliate. So we're talking about some, some fairly good sized beans, but they're not flowering yet. Um, here's the amount of nutrient they're taking up per day, per acre. So about seven pounds of nitrogen a day. So a lot of, uh, or, or per, um, uh, yeah, those would be per acre factors. So you can look at all those other nutrients, potassium, four pounds of potassium a day. Now, now a lot of that potassium is not gonna leave the field in the grain. It's gonna stay behind in the residue, so they're not gonna use that much. Uh, a lot of the nitrogen does leave the field in the grain. You know, so soybeans have a ton of nitrogen in the seed. A lot, of, a lot of you soybean producers in the room, so you guys know, why do we grow beans? What do you use soybeans for? Bean. Protein source, right? So bean meal, protein. So what's in protein? From a chemistry standpoint, lots of nitrogen. So corn, primarily a starch crop, very little nitrogen in starch. So, so corn takes a lot of nitrogen to produce, but, but not much of that nitrogen is leaving the field in the grain. So uh, let's look a little bit at nitrogen data here. Nitrogen's fun to talk about whether you're talking about corn or soybeans. Uh, and I apologize, I'm flipping through some stuff here. This is some of Dr. Belo's work again. So, so soybeans in theory will have a very tough time supplying the amount of nitrogen they need once they get beyond 70 bushels. If you figure how much nitrogen it takes to produce 70 bushel beans, it's gonna be hard for them to fix it and acquire it from the soil. So in theory, in high yield soybeans, we should be able to increase their yield by applying nitrogen. So here's Dr. Belo's work from 2015. He looked at these four timings. He looked at several different forms of nitrogen and they're all 100 pounds actual in. So he's not screwing around with 10 or 20 or 15 pounds. It's 100 units of nitrogen. And I'm gonna tell you, if you're gonna play with nitrogen in soybeans, don't do anything less than 60 units. Soybeans, when they're using seven pounds an acre a day, you know, what's 10 pounds gonna do? That's a day and a half worth of nitrogen for, for an acre of soybeans. So if you wanna fertilize soybeans with nitrogen, which I'm not recommending, by the way, but if you want to, we're talking pretty high levels of nutrient. And you can see here, well, a little more statistical lesson, the, the ones with the ascaris, that means it was statistically significant treatment effect at that location. So, so he had some yield responses. 
you know, who, who in here, what's a, what's a current end price on nitrogen? Probably what, 40 cents a pound, 35 cents a pound, depends on the form probably. So 100 pounds is say 40 bucks, not counting application. You know, there's not many profitable responses up there. And, and in this day and age, with the environmental concerns we have, I'm, I'm not sure we're, you know, we don't really have a good argument to be putting nitrogen on soybeans, based on most of the data that I've seen. You can see some phenomenal responses. For every 10 bushel response you get, you're going to get eight or 10, one or two bushel responses. You average all that together, um, it's just been pretty inconsistent. So this is some other data. This is some of Dr. Nassiger's data. A uh, whole bunch of different nitrogen treatments and nada. I mean, you got one little blip there, but you know, here's the, here's the no nitrogen check, and you know, there, there are not any significant differences there. A little bit of data from moderator is here, so we must be close to the end of our time. Um, so a little bit of data from Monmouth here. Again, saw some, saw some bumps, saw a little bit of yield increase, but notice the scale here. 75 units, 100 units, 200 units of N. So, anyway, I better stop there so we can rotate. Any, any quick questions? Uh, if not, I'll be around. Appreciate your attention and your time. Mm -hmm.